Welcome in Rose City to Soccer Made in Portland. I'm Ryan Clark, joined by Chris Reifer on this toasty week in the Pacific Northwest. Um, a, an eventful week coming up, no doubt, for Portland sports teams, mainly the Trailblazers, but also the potential Major League Baseball team discussions have been picking back up. And there's some soccer to talk about. The Portland Timbers and Thorns uh, both have some matches this Saturday. Uh, and they are coming off a, a couple of matches earlier in the week that we will have a chance to discuss. Ryan, so, I have a question. Yes. How old are you? I am 27 years old. It's a good age. Really good age, honestly. Uh, you're just like really in the, in the you know, like the, the, the like golden years. Everybody talks about the golden years being later. Like that tw- late 20s, that's good stuff. You're smart enough to know a couple of things. Uh, you know, you got a good job. You're uh, advancing in your career. Sure. Prime time. The Portland baseball discussion has been happening your entire life. (laughs) (laughs) We have had we have had a number of glorified sticker and hat companies uh, come on through Portland uh, over the course of your entire life. I'm not kidding. Entire life. Since yep. you were born in 1996, I just did some mental math there. 95, oh, 95, late 95, uh, yeah, all right, barely, yeah. barely under the window. Right. December 28th. Yeah, so. Nice, nice. Uh, and and so yeah, we've we've had a number of uh, of sticker and hat companies that that have come through Portland that have been uh, that have been doing that stuff over the course of literally your entire life. Yeah, I know. I've got I've got friends, dads who have the MLB to PDX stickers from from the 90s from from that's that time ex- that's period. exactly yeah. right <laughs> so you know uh, it's it's an ongoing discussion let's say show me the money <laughs> show me the billionaires who are coming in saying portland is where i want to put an mlb team then i'll get interested indeed on the soccer side the portland timbers are coming off a 1-1 draw against nycfc uh they feel like they they should have gotten three points in that match given NYCFC's recent form, given that should it's a have home sh- match. Should've. Should have should have. Yeah. They 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 have been dropping points left and right. Gio has has spoken about it candidly over the last couple of weeks that they're they're dropping points. The the games are coming and it's gonna end up being too late was was the quote that he had so uh, paraphrasing a little bit there. It it might be. And and that's that's the <laughs> the rub in this scenario. And now they've, you know, they've got additional injuries. They, you know, Blanco and Esprit are not going to play on Saturday in Minnesota. Um, Zach McGraw's gone with international duty. And then Evander smacked somebody in the face and is suspended that'll happen. For, for Saturday. That'll, that'll happen when you pretty clearly intentionally reach back to smack somebody in the face when you're going for a, a dead ball uh, to set up. Like whether he's going to break the guy's nose or not, that's a red card every single time. Right. And, Every and, time. And it's yeah. not a difficult decision for the disciplinary committee, given that it wasn't awarded on the field. Uh, the VAR, I don't know, was out for a smoke break or something. Uh, and uh, game was pretty <laughs> close to being over. I honestly, yeah, they you know. just like just mail it in, like heading on back down to the locker room. Who knows? But I, I was kind of checked out myself, so I don't really blame <laughs> them. But, <laughs> you know, it's it's uh, it's either way. They, I think, got it right in the end, even though it's unfortunate, obviously, for the Timbers to not have him. He's he's number one on the team in goals scored, you know, goal contributions, um, effective passes, second in pass percentage behind Diego Chara, who's you know god tier in in that category. I mean, it's it's going to be a it's going to be a major loss for for them against Minnesota in a match that's that's really crucial. Everyone is crucial at this point for them when you're chasing points and you're outside of the expanded playoff picture, tenth right now in a in a nine team playoff situation um it's not really a lot uh, a lot of positivity to to discuss other than the miguel araujo signing which dropped today and we can discuss that further after we we break down this uh nycfc match yeah evander's got to be smarter you know i i that's that's just the long and short of it evander's got to be smarter uh that's just the kind of thing there's there's nothing he actually like to the extent that he was responding to the to a challenge on uh, Noel Kalaskan, he hit the wrong guy. <laughs> so so the, there's one basis on which Evander's got to be smarter. Uh, and and second, yeah, I mean, if it was something else, who's to say? But look, I mean, you you shouldn't be doing that ever, right? I understand, you know, wanting to stand up for your teammates and all that kind of stuff, but. You can do that in a lot of ways 
that don't get you suspended for the next game. And doing that is going to get you suspended for the next game every single time, whether the referee sees it or not. That's not a hard decision for anybody. And so you you don't want to be doing that. There's never a circumstance in which it's smart <laughs> to get suspended for the next game. And especially here, where the Timbers are desperate, right? I mean, they are on life support at this point. Uh, and they are going, you know, you don't want to be calling games against a non-playoff team in July must win games because they're sort of right around where you're at in the table, but that's where the Timbers are. And if they go to Minnesota and the loons beat them, which I think the odds makers probably would say is the likeliest outcome. uh, I mean, then you're, I think both a game and three points behind the team in 10th. I mean, the, the, even, even the, the red line, which is very low this year, It is a very low bar to get into the playoffs. Even that's starting to get get a little ways away. And so to get suspended for a game like that, it's just not smart. And if Evander is going to be a leader on this team, and I think he probably has that aspiration, uh, he certainly needs to be one of the best players on the team. I think he has been at times this year. He's at other times been disappointing. Uh, You can't do that. I mean, you, you've got to be smarter than that. And so, uh, you know, I I worry that the apathy of stinking kind of makes people just shrug this off uh, <laughs> because the Timbers do stink. That's just it. Uh, it is extremely unlikely that Evander's suspension will end up making a difference because the Timbers are probably going to stink regardless. But you can't let the apathy of stinking, you know, prevent you from addressing a situation like that because you hope that at some point Evander is going to play meaningful soccer for the Timbers and you want him to be a leader at that point and you want him to be one of the best players on the team and this is just the kind of thing that leaders and and, and those kinds of players don't do and the NYC FC match in particular um, you know not not a lot in the way of offensive production for either squad it was it was a bit of a rough one NYC FC hasn't won a game in 12 yeah, they have not won a match in in twelve. Scuffling 12. doesn't even begin to yeah, describe it, the pigeons right now. They are the pigeons right now. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's it's two teams on the outside looking in that played each other and played a, a pretty boring and uneventful match. And and the the Timbers, if you're going to be the the team that you want to be, which you know at this point it's a lot more talking about wanting to be that than the actions on the field backing it up and and both or the actions off the field to be honest yeah yeah, players and uh and coaches have said as much in recent weeks and in fact that's a that's a strong segue to to a discussion point that i wanted to to touch on (laughs) which is uh the comments from dario zuperich at training this week uh to me when when i was out there um he, he talked about the the need for the timbers to sign uh players of quality to to invest more money in doing so uh and was very blunt in only the way that uh that somebody of his eastern european background can be um and and it was really um the first and most honest i think answer of of that type from from a timbers player this season you know we've seen Timbers players like Zach McGraw, who's a good leader, talk about, um, you know, mentality, which is a word I know you love, Chris. I mean, um, it's not a word I love. It's just a word that the, <laughs> that that various people within the Timbers organization seem to use very, 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 very differently. They do, um, you know, in, in very differing ways, including Dario, who, by the way, said their mentality is wrong, uh, adding to, to that I know, chorus. It's just, um, I, I don't know. Is it good? Yeah. Is it bad? It's it's Schrodinger's mentality at this point. What is mentality? What is mentality? That is the question. Um, but his his comments about about the roster uh, are are particularly striking. Um, and you know, I'm I'm sure that the the folks that are in management for the Timbers don't appreciate those type of comments because they are they feel like and they have they have come out and talked about um, the moves that they have made that they want to make that they say they're going to make uh to improve the roster but 
this is a veteran player who's who's respected who uh you know plays heavy minutes who's important to what they do um has been with the timbers for a while and and he, he came out flat and said yeah we we just need more quality players uh the the injuries don't help that and he noted noted that you know the injuries are a big part of why the early season was the way it was for the Timbers, but but the Timbers are just victims of injuries. No, they're not by any means victims of injuries. Their their last few weeks of play, which has been really bad, has been with essentially their full strength lineup, and um, now they have a couple more injuries again. But that's not the reason for what potential bad results may lie ahead. Right? They they very clearly have acknowledged both Gio Savarese has and players now have that their roster needs improvement. And this is, this is Dario going a step further and saying that the team not only needs to sign these players, but they need to spend the money in the way that other teams do. So I'm, I'm wondering what your reaction was to, to what Dario said. My reaction is he's right. You know, I, I think the, the, the one thing that you can look at that's just a really discreet kind of irrefutable point on this. And actually, let's take a moment. I want to address the injuries issue for just a second. Because this excuse is thrown around, thrown in our face basically every year. And to the extent that you are having these injury concerns that are providing excuses on a regular basis, at some point, that's not, you can't just chalk that up to bad luck, right? You have to look at internal factors that might be creating that situation whether it's decisions about retaining players who have pre-existing injuries or who are injury prone whether it's training practices whether it's issues with the sports science and training uh, and medical staff I, I mean those are the kinds of things you need to be looking at you they are not just victims of this they can't just claim to be oh Eeyore here we go again. Injuries are derailing another season. That's just <laughs> does not. That a, that's does that apply to the MLS rules too? I mean, because that's that's something that a lot of people in in power at a lot of different clubs in, in MLS have talked about as a limit, limiting factor. The last thing I want to hear from anybody, anybody in the Timbers organization right now is that we are just too limited by MLS rules to be able to do this. That is absolute BS. Because there is one. Big MLS rule that every team in the league knows about that we have talked about all year long that they have just chosen not to avail themselves of that would give them enormous flexibility to add to their roster. They have not used their annual amnesty provision this year. Even though they are carrying multiple players on high TAM contracts who have huge effective salary cap hits and who are not effective. And yes, I am talking about Yaroslav Nizhgoda. I am talking, even though it's tied up in a lot more emotions, Sebastian Blanco. I'm talking about Laris Mabiala. I'm talking about, even to some extent, I'm talking about Jimmy Chara. Like, I think you could make a case for amnestying any of those guys. If the Timbers were truly motivated to go out and reinforce their roster and to do it for 2023, they have the ability to do that within the current rules. So don't sit here and tell me that, oh, the rules just aren't flexible enough for us to be able to do this. That's BS. There are things you can do now, literally today, that will give you the flexibility to go out to address this. They just haven't done it. So Dario's right. <laughs> like, he's just right. And there's no real way around it for the Timbers. So, you know, I mean, I don't really want to hear, like, I agree the rules should be made more flexible. We should get rid of a lot of this interfencing. Like MLS should like really look at that to allow teams more flexibility in choosing how they're going to spend their roster budget. I couldn't agree with that more. But that is a totally separate question from whether the Timbers have done the things within the current rules that they need to do to make this roster competitive. They just haven't. And there's no excuse for it other than they just haven't done it. Right. And everybody's operating under these same rules theoretically, right? Maybe not enter Miami. Maybe some folks could argue not LAFC at times, but then you look at LAFC, they have this year because of the compressed nature of the schedule. And because of the limitations of those roster rules, they have, they too have suffered. Right. But at the same time, there are teams around the league who have 
made more significant moves and uh, invested in different ways than the Timbers have. Their counter argument uh, in that case would be, well, we, we've spent $10 million on Evander. They expect to spend more uh, in the near future, likely on a, on a young DP winger at, from what I have heard from around the organization is, is somebody that they want to invest more money in. And, and that's great. And those, those two signings, if they go well, that's, that's why you invest. But there are ancillary moves and moves around the edges that you can and should make that absolutely will create more financial flexibility that will allow you to invest in better and younger players than you currently have at different positions. There, There is more that can be done. And I think that that is that's something that Timbers fans right now are upset about is is the the kind of stagnation of the last two years that that exists with this roster. Yeah, I mean, it is true. They spent a lot of money on Evander. It's probably true that they're going to spend more money on whatever young DP and maybe even another DP that they've kind of talked about in the in the winter. Um, that they're going to spend more money on those things. But that's it. Like, that is not really the issue. <laughs> uh, that, I mean, that that just the, like Merritt Paulson's balance sheet is not what we're talking about here. It's whether they're using all of the resources that are available to them to build the roster out. And, and I mean, the irrefutable answer is just that they're not. For whatever reason, they're just not. And so, you know, notwithstanding signing Evander, notwithstanding an, another young DP signing or U22 signing or, or, or whatever they're going to do over the course of the next month or the next six months, Dario's still right. And, and you know, I, I think if, I, I think frankly the Timbers organization would be a lot better served taking a hard look and recognizing that and thinking about how they're going to fix that going forward than trying to weasel out of it or, or shade the comments or, or, or whatever. Because he's just right. Next match for the Timbers is at... 5.30 p.m. Pacific time on Saturday. They play Minnesota United on the road. That one is only available through Apple TV on MLS Season Pass. Um, that match we we talked about briefly, Chris, but it's it's two you know wooden spoon territory teams, or I guess slightly above wooden spoon territory. If you're you know essentially crowning the galaxy <laughs> early in that respect. But, yeah, I mean that that you know, that Rapids. Colorado Rapids LA Galaxy race really looks like a a, a pillow fight for the ages. A, a true race to the bottom, and and guess who the Timbers get to play on the Fourth of July? None other than the Colorado Rapids, right? On on short rest, very short rest after this Minnesota game, so which has not gone well for them in the past. I, I mean, the, look, the short rest games. I'm sorry to bring the conversation back to this, but the short rest games are exactly the kind of games that I think you see most dramatically the lack of depth on the roster, right? Yep. Because definitely. in in those games where Gio's got to be managing minutes and doing things like that, when he looks down at his bench, he's like, all right, Yarrow, come back in. Here we go again. Like, you've gone from a one-dimensional player when you were scoring goals to a zero-dimensional player, but, you know, let's do it. Uh, and, and that's where you see it. And so... Yeah, I mean, uh, another short turnaround uh, in in which, you know, it's the kind of thing where that we've seen the Timbers struggle with in the past. They've had two separate windows now where they've really dropped a lot of points uh, that should have been attainable because of these things. And so here we go again. Yeah, this is this is, you know, serious territory. I th- you could argue and you have argued that the season is essentially toast already, but you come out of these two road matches without any points or with like one or two points. uh, It's, it's extremely grim despite how close in points the Timbers are to ninth and eighth. I mean, whatever, you know, it ain't shoot. As you said, it's, it's, (laughs) it, these are two matches that uh, you don't want to say could, could officially shut the door because the door is never quite shut, but, they they are in a tough yeah. spot. It's hard hard to word it. But yeah. M- MLS has has worked tirelessly 
to take as many locks and latches off that door uh, as possible. <laughs> and yet, and yet <laughs> it is getting, it is not at the point where it feels barred, but like the door is closed and they're starting to pile furniture on the other side. And pretty soon it's not going to be too many more games. Every time they lose a game, like that's another, you know, chair. And if they lose both in this next window, that's like a dresser that goes in front of that door uh, for them. It just gets so much, so much harder uh, with every game that goes by. And, and we're not far from being at that point where it's just not going to happen. Before we get to, to discussion of the thorns uh, this week, we, we can touch on the two signings that uh, have been announced today for, for the Timbers. We've got uh, Victor Griffith being called up from T2 in the midfield uh, for, for the remainder of the season, uh, more of a holding midfielder type to add depth at a spot where um, in, in the central midfield, they don't have a lot right now, especially given some of the injuries that they are dealing with Eric Williamson and David Ajala being at the top of that list. Uh, and, and Miguel Araujo, the Peruvian center back who, who joins them from the Dutch league, uh, 28 years old, uh, 28 caps with Peru, including, um, a matchup with Lionel Messi at one point, which <laughs> was a, a, f- a funny photo that I was able to find in the AP photo database that was him tackling Messi, a couple MLS players. What, what can you say? But, um, you know, Araujo is somebody that will add depth for them at the, the center back position. He's not necessarily somebody that's slated to be a day one starter. He's an experienced player with a lot of international experience in addition to, um, you know, for different clubs around the world. Um, you'd expect that with McGraw gone, um, if he is in form and ready to roll, Araujo is somebody that could start alongside Dario Zuperich while McGraw is, is unavailable. But after McGraw's back, he's definitely the, their third CB with, with you know, Larry Smabiala kind of being at that point in his career where he's, he's not c- capable of being a regular contributor. So, and I think the hope is that if it goes well by the end of the season, he is very much competing, probably with Zuperich for that next starting spot. Oh, right, but especially that- next year, given given Zuperich's age and experience, that you know he he Araujo will will be somebody that they envision being alongside Zach uh, into the future. Uh, I have one question for you that I couldn't tell if this was a joke or not. Uh, at the end of his media availability, did did Zuperich really say like something like "Okay, see you in five years again"? He did That's because amazing. he doesn't like doing media. That's but incredible. He ma- I, he also th- I think yeah. made sure that he will not be put back into that <laughs> position because <laughs> he, he was very hesitant at first when uh, when the the media relations folks were waving him down. He was like, "Oh no, no, please, no!" <laughs> like he was barefoot, like walking off the field, like trying to like get out of there as soon as possible. And I was like, "No, it's okay. We'll make it quick." And you know, then he said what he said honestly so. spectacular work from dario i that's yeah it's just so good <laughs> yeah he's 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 his blunt honesty is uh is relentless and and you, you hear it and <laughs> <laughs> you sure do uh and you know probably probably gonna be five years or so until he gets put uh, you know called over for another media availability well the the other funny thing to to tie it back to the Araujo signing is uh is I actually was the one to break to Dario that they were signing Miguel Araujo he had no idea before I said to him he's like he's like who is that and, and I, I said he's a Peruvian center back they're signing him just to add, you know add depth to the team he's like oh good we need more quality players and then that started the um you know the the further discussion that he had on that subject but uh Tremendous. Yeah. Great, great work. Who, who is that guy? Great, is great Dario work. Super Rich's thoughts on the signing. Great work all around. Your, your thoughts on that signing, though, Chris? I mean, Araujo to, to add depth there, and then Victor Griffith uh, for, for the midfield. We'll see. Interesting profile. Uh, but I think it's it's about the profile you would have expected. Uh, Era de Vici, where he was playing previously in, in the Netherlands, is not known for being among the more defensive-oriented leagues. Uh, it is not sort of Serie A uh, in, in that respect. Uh, there are definitely good teams. There are really good players uh, in, in in that league. Uh, it sounds like he was not on one of those good teams, but that could very well be due to factors other than him. Uh, and the fact that he's been capped 28 t- times by a Peruvian national team that I think is pretty solid. Uh, not South American powers by any means, but always sort of competitive for one of those last 
uh, World Cup qualification spots. They've qualified a few times. Uh, you know, the fact that he has been a relative regular in their national team setup uh, indicates that that this is an, an interesting profile of signing. Is it a sure thing? No, not by a long shot, right? Uh, and so we're going to just have to wait and see how exactly it plays out and how he fits into the Timbers setup. Uh, but, uh, you know, I mean, the, I, I think that is about the profile of player that you would have expected the Timbers to go after. Uh, for a center back. So we'll see how it goes. And Griffith? You know, I mean, a, a, he, he's a death player coming up from T2. I think that's, that, that's really about it. They need another body in central midfield. Uh, right. And in the absence of, you know, I, I think it doesn't make a bunch of sense for the Timbers to make a big signing at that spot right now. A, they don't probably have the salary cap space because they inexplicably have not done the things that they need to do to, to make that salary cap space uh, to make a major signing in that spot. But B, I mean, I'm not sure it's a place that makes a lot of sense for them to invest a bunch of long-term resources right now, just given that there are, they have, you know, Christian Paredes is part of that setup for the foreseeable future. Uh, Evander is in that mix as long as they're going to stick with sort of the three player midfield, Eric Williamson. I mean, maybe comes back in, but you've got a lot of attacking players there. Uh, Diego Chara is still there. I think that's probably an area that they're going to have to do some longer term planning come the off season, but does it make sense to do it right now? No, it probably doesn't. Uh, but they do need another, another player who can come in and give them some minutes when somebody's out, uh, or in some of these, some of these windows. And, you know, he, he, Griffith is the depth player. This is a big opportunity for him. Maybe he'll come in and step up and, and make an impression, but more often, you know, these kinds of signings turn out to be depth kind of signings, as we've seen with guys like Renzo Zambrano in the past, uh, Pablo Bonilla, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, even Marvin Loria. I, I, I think those are, all, you know, it's kind of that sort of thing. So hopefully he comes in and he, and he makes an impression and is able to stick. Uh, but I think the expectation is, is that this is a depth signing. Definitely. Speaking of depth, the Portland Thorns are testing theirs in the coming weeks with six players off on World Cup duty. Um, before they all left, though, Sophia Smith decided to go nuclear and have a hat trick uh, against uh, against a team that really competed well. I thought yeah. in the in the spirit, you know, it was a four to two match and and one that could have been four to three or, or even you know three three in the end, but. Um, How's Soph that Sophia just, Smith? Is that how's that Sophia Smith slump? That's hard to say. Uh, wow. How's that Sophia Smith slump uh, treating everybody now? Huh? It it does not exist. It has been it never exploded. Existed. It never it, it existed. Never, it was a there fantasy you go. the entire time. Well, she was frustrated personally with the no goals in seven matches, but she still was like dishing out assists and was before Sam Coffey passed her the league leader in assists. So she was still doing great things, contributing. Uh, with goals she now is at 10 goals and five assists which is ridiculous at this point running away I think and and there are other players who are definitely in the MVP conversation but I don't know how you could possibly give it to somebody other than Soph at this stage just given the the form she's in given how important she is to a great team and just she's the best player in the league and and she's shown it for for weeks on end the true Sophia Smith slump was the bad tweets that you all made along the way uh, it was, I, th there was no slump. She had been playing great the entire time. <laughs> and when good sc goal scorers play great, like they're going to score goals, but she had been making plays like, like that had all been happening. And so this is, there, there are no surprises here. Every, everybody who'd been watching closely knew that this was coming and that this was coming back and that it was not a matter of her not being involved in games. And so, yeah, nobody's surprised. She is a superlative player. And when you have a superlative player, they can put in performances like she did against Washington that I thought bailed the Thorns out a little bit. Again, I thought the game was too open. Uh, and and I, I think Washington's a good team. Uh, and the difference between the two teams was one team had Sophia Smith and the other didn't. And it's nice to have a yeah. player like Sophia Smith. Uh, yeah, without those goals from Smith, it's 2-1 Washington, right? Yeah. You know, there's, that's just an easy, easy stat for you there. And, you know, I mean, even just with, with the, the the way the game went, it's not to say the Thorns were poor. I, I thought this was a game between two pretty good teams. But between those two pretty good teams, even two very good teams, uh, 
one of those two very good teams had Sophia Smith and the other one didn't. And so the one that had Sophia Smith won four two. Uh and and the Thorns have the Thorns just have those players. Right? And I think sort of in turning the conversation, I I, I think probably to the 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 more timely uh question of of how the Thorns are going to manage this period without Sophia Smith at all. The Thorns just have the players to be able to kind of like roll it out and be like, on any given day, this is going to be good enough to get it done against a lot of teams. Uh, yeah, re- regardless of tactical issues or regardless of of who's leading the way, um, there are in, a lot of problems spot. that Sophia yeah. Smith and Crystal Dunn and 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 uh, when she's in there, Becky Sauerbrunn. But I mean, there there are a lot of problems that those kinds of players can solve. Now they're entering a stretch, and and look, every team in the league is in the same boat. So I'm not here to say that this is a unique Thorns issue, but now they're entering in, in, into stretch where they kind of don't have a lot of those kinds of players, right? They still got some good players. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I think Sam Coffey, I think Olivia Moultrie, I think Morgan Weaver, uh, I, I I think Kelly Hubley, uh, they have a number of players who can really compete and who I think are are plenty good enough to get wins during the stretch. But this is where Mike Norris kind of has to earn his stripes, Right. Uh, this is going to be the stretch. Now he's got to be able to make decisions to put those players in the best positions that they can be to influence these games to get these wins. Uh, and I don't think there was a lot to take from the Thorns loss to the rain in Challenge Cup, uh, other than the fact that they've got to figure some of those things out. Uh, and so, you know, I and I say this truly with an open mind. I, you know, I, I, I think... Uh, there have been ish- there have been some challenges uh, with the way Norris has set up the team, but I also think they're top of the table. So he's not doing he's not incompetent. He's not doing anything terrible. But we're going to kind of see what what he's made of uh, as a coach over the course of these next few weeks, and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I think this is the one of the first times that we truly get an opportunity to assess him. Uh, he's going to have to show some flexibility. He's going to have to show some creativity, and frankly, he's got to show that he's got the buy in of the team. Uh, but if he can succeed over the course of this next month or so month or six weeks, uh, I, then I, th- I think that'll be a big feather in his cap. And it would bode well, I think for the remainder of the season for this team, right? Because succeeding during this stretch is, is going to empower those depth players and those, those players that are left who are, who are in their own right stars, right? I think Morgan Weaver is a star in NWSL. I think, you know, a player like Sam Coffey is undoubtedly a star in NWSL. She should, be at the world cup. We we can say yeah. that ad nauseum as everyone else has, she should be there with the U S Sophia Smith came out in support of her during that post game presser after uh, a really excellent performance from, from coffee, including an assist on the Weaver goal. That was the fourth, uh, a little blooper that was just perfect. She, she, she leads the league in assists as a holding midfielder and she has consistently really been, good. yeah, she's really, really freaking good. good. And, and when you get, praise like that from not only Sophia Smith, who's a great young player, but from a legend of the game and Christine Sinclair, who doesn't pull punches, doesn't, you know, BS people and, you know, hype people up for no reason. She's honest. She's seen a lot in her career at 40 years old and has said clearly and like unambiguously that Sam Coffey is the best holding midfielder in NWSL. And that's a big statement. And so having somebody like that in Coffey who, not only has been excellent on the field, but is a leader, is somebody that has stepped into that captain's role. And I, I think with one match under her belt as as captain, thrived. She's somebody that that thrives in leadership and, and has that kind of binding voice and presence for a team that will be crucial. So so for players like her, for players like Morgan and Olivia Moultrie and Izzy Dequila and Raina Reyes and others who are going to be in more prominent roles in these coming weeks, Having that success will be vital to the Thorns chances down the stretch uh, and heading into the playoffs, because then you know that regardless of situation or injury or whatever happens down the down the road in 2023, you can rely on those players to step up if your stars who have not relented this season somehow aren't there or somehow are being keyed on uh, or taken out of a match. And for each of those players, this is a huge opportunity. I, I think I think the armband should stay on coffee uh, because I think that's 
I think that is her her next step to go from being sort of a a young up and coming impressive holding midfielder to sort of a a, a central presence a captain a captain's presence within team. I think that that is her next step. Uh, I think Morgan Weaver's next step is to be a bona fide star uh, and to prove that she also should be in the national team setup. I think Raina Reyes has an opportunity to say, hey, look, whatever else you've got on the team, I need to be starting. I need to be starting at, at, at one of those two fullback positions. Figure out where it's going to be, but I need to be one of them. Uh, and I think she's got an opportunity to show that over the course of this next month or so. Uh, Olivia Moultrie, same same deal. Uh, you know, you and I have talked a lot in this space about whether we think Moultrie should be selected over over Christine Sinclair. Well, now Moultrie's going to be because she has that spot in pin for the next for the next month plus. And if she plays well, that makes the decision for for Norris, right? Uh, if she does if she does well in that spot, uh, that makes the decision. And so I, I think those players have to, Izzy Dequilla, I think is in a, a similar spot in terms of sort of establishing herself as a, I must be part of this rotation. I might not, you know, because there's Morgan Weaver and Crystal Dunn and, and Hina Sugida and, and, and Sophia Smith, I might not start, but I'm playing every game. I'm playing 15 to 30 minutes every single game. And that's the opportunity that she has in this period to show that she's just the kind of player that you got to do that with. Uh, and, and, and so if, the, if those kinds of players, and if this is the, the message that Norris is sending to the team and they're buying it, that those kinds of players have this opportunity, this unique opportunity to really get a foothold on the roles that they have shown at times the aptitude to have, and they go after it with, aggr- with aggressiveness, I think it's going to be good for the team. I think it's going to be good for those players. Uh, and I think that is the thing that will make the Thorns – I mean that 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 could just that I mean frankly could could make them be what we've said that they could be all year, which is kind of the the dominant team team in NWSL this year, and so we'll see. But uh, but it, it's going to be an exciting period to watch. I think a lot of people have a lot to prove from Mike Norris to to a lot of those players. And you know this stretch is is important. Every stretch is important, but this one even more so without those players, right? Because you have two regular season matches on the docket at least without um, without all of them. All six will be gone for Saturday against Kansas City, and then the following week when they head out to Gotham. Um, of note, you know Gotham FC has former Thorns players Manashim and Sinead Farley on their roster, which is an amazing thing to see. I, th- I think for, for both of those individuals who deserve every opportunity and, and have been voices for transformative change in the sport. So that that's an aside. Absolutely. An Although Sinead one. very excitingly will be at the world cup with Ireland. Yes. Yes. That too. Um, so she won't be there for that match, but you know, she, she's on that roster and um, yeah, they are two big games. And then the third one potentially missing like the U S players, if they're there or, or Canada or, or what have you, if, if they're missing August 20th, there's, there's a regular season match as well. You'd think that if, if the other players make deep runs into the world cup, they won't be there either. Um, but this is, this is big. This is a big test, not only for Mike Norris, but for these individual players who, um, who need and want this opportunity to prove themselves uh, and, and this could be the forging of, of a dynasty in these moments, right? The idea that the thorns could, um, build what they need to build to get a championship in 2024 or excuse me, in 2023, look ahead to 2024, uh, with, with, you know, still the most championships in NWSL coming off back to back, maybe it, throw a shield in there too. If things work out in a very tight race, um, it, it would be historic for for women's soccer in the united states and and allow the thorns that were to regardless of what's happening off the field their ownership situation uh what they've been through um to to assert themselves as the class of, of this league as it enters its second decade and so that next match for the thorns comes up on saturday uh, against kansas city that's 7 p.m on cbs sports network um, so that will be the first of two regular season matches for the Thorns. The second being at Gotham, July 9th, 2 30 PM Pacific on Paramount plus. 
that will wrap it up for us here on Soccer Made in Portland. Uh, for Chris Reifer, I'm Ryan Clark. Thanks for joining us. Make sure to like us, subscribe to us wherever you get your podcast. Follow us on Twitter at Soccer Made in PDX, at Chris Reifer, at Ryan T. Clark. Uh, leave a review if you so choose. Love seeing some more reviews lately from folks, uh, not just because they're positive, but because I enjoy hearing from people uh, and, and they had some great constructive criticism and feedback uh, in there as well. So we, we love to hear from everybody. Uh, we'll, we'll probably do some listener questions next week too, just, just to get our finger on the pulse of, uh, of the fan base as well. Uh, so, so we will be posting that on Twitter next week. Keep an eye out for that. Uh, and thanks again for joining us. 